Wow. This is a dream come true. Um, the whole idea of being able to speak at a TED conference, even a TEDx conference, has been something that I've looked forward to for, well, since I've, I've been aware of the, the project. Um, so when a colleague of mine left a voicemail about two weeks ago that started out saying, wow, I saw that you're speaking at this big conference. You, you can imagine how uh, I just felt the pride until he went on, he said, what do you know about alternative energy? <laughs> and it went down a little bit. Fortunately, Ted has uh, an out-of-the-box sort of perspective about presentations. And um, I've spent a lot of time looking at, uh, thinking about how to make learning sustainable. Fifteen years I've been thinking about this. and. So now I need to try to figure out how to put that all into 15 minutes. So let's start. Um, one of the things that I've learned in that, those 15 years is the importance of connecting, connecting the known to the new. And so I'm going to give up some, some of my priceless time here to ask you to consider what are the differences and the similarities between students and learners. So take a moment, please jot something down related to what are the similarities and differences between students and learners because we want to build upon that. One group came up with this. Student, and I'm a learner. What does a learner do? Lots of stuff. Hmm. Do you have perfect attendance? No, I do. Did you get a 2200 on your SATs? No, I did. Did you get an A on your term paper? Not exactly. I did. It's called Architects of the 18th Century. <laughs> Want to read it? Uh, sure. Oh, before I forget, I have an invitation for you. So, this is the kind of thing learners do. They party. It's more of a housewarming. You own a house? I helped build and design a house. You what? It was a group project. We worked with Habitat for Humanity to build an eco-sustainable house. They're going to use it as a model for their other projects. Wow. That's the kind of stuff learners do. <laughs> but did you get an A? So watching this, it's clear there's a problem with students. Or at least that's the perspective of this group, that there's some sort of a problem with students. Besides the fact I, I was thinking about Sean in terms of the, the paper product that students create, it made me wonder I need to be, or be a little bit more cognizant about the fact when I ask students to turn something in, is it worth the paper that it's printed on, so to speak? Or, you know, are there other ways that I can go about doing that? That seems to be a problem. But there's more than just that, uh, more than just the consuming of paper products. There's also this sort of consumer mentality uh, that goes along with students that I think we need to be careful about. And um, I'd like to think about three questions that I find students ask quite a bit in my classrooms, both when I was a middle school teacher and now while I'm here at Grand Valley, and what that means in terms of sustainability. This is the first one, and it's actually, I think, a pretty reasonable question for students to ask. And I think it's reasonable because we tend to, from a consumer standpoint, put before them such an abundance of information. And, and when they see all of it, I heard just, what, in the last couple of weeks that um, they did a, a, a mapping of the oceans and found over a thousand new species. When you put that in front of students and they think, more stuff to learn, more stuff I have to consume, this is a reasonable question. 
But the problem with that perspective is that, and I think someone missing in that video, are the dropouts because of the fact that there's too much information. This is not a sustainable approach. This question's actually a trap, okay? My students often ask this question, and the acceptable answer, I don't know, isn't, the, the actual answer isn't the acceptable answer. So we end up, when I was asked this question, reaching for a reason. Why do I need to do this math? Well, you need to be able to add and subtract fractions for, in order to cook. You need to add and subtract decimals in order to um, uh, balance your checkbook. You need to be able to do percentages so that you can figure out the tip correctly. I got news for you, right? There's an app for that. <laughs> the honest truth is that we're preparing students for the past and the present. We are using a maintain approach as opposed to a sustainable approach, and we need to be able to make the adjustment. This really um, hits me real close. This was sort of related to the uh, research that I did for my dissertation. Students who would look at a test and say, you can't ask me this, you didn't show me how to do it. I had a student here, uh, one of my first years in a college uh, algebra class that I was teaching, and I was trying to do it on a discovery-based model, so it was a little bit different from what they've experienced before so that they could learn this content deeper. One student came up to me at the end of this activity and said, you know, I know there's an easier way. My middle school teacher showed me an easier way. My high school teacher showed me an easier way. Why don't you just show me an easier way? And without thinking, my response was, how's that working out for you? It's not, this is a learned helplessness. Now, I know there are a lot of students out in the audience, and I hope, hopefully you're not taking offense from this consumer mentality that I'm trying to present. This is trained. This is part of the system that we grow up in, and so we need to rethink it. We need to think about, is this a sustainable? It's learned helplessness. We've, we've trained students to think this way. So what can we do? I'm a student. And I'm a learner. And I'm a teacher. So teacher, what's my next assignment? Good question. What is your next assignment? Unless you tell me what to do next, I won't know what to do next. <clears throat> I'm supposed to be a teacher. I'm also a learner. Okay, now you're blurring the lines on me. Now you're getting it. No, I'm not. Okay. What do you want to learn? This is so weird. Aren't you supposed to be telling me? Well, don't you see? You have a chance to learn about something that interests you. But he's answering my questions with other questions. It's actually very uncomfortable. <clears throat> well, he's inviting you to be a learner, like me. How does one become a learner? Exactly. What? But at least it wasn't a question. I just want to know how to get an A! So is there anything that we can do? I believe there is. And I believe the answer to what we can do is found in Scotland. Yeah. Not literally, but metaphorically. A couple years ago, my wife and I went there for a, um, a second honeymoon, 10 years, and uh, as I looked around, there were just so many reminders of what a, a sustainable approach to educa excuse me, education might look like. One of those things was, this is Roslyn Chapel, uh, just outside of Edinburgh, and there are two pieces to this um, uh, picture in particular that I want you to focus on. 
One is the flying buttresses. Okay, those are, from those of you who know your architecture and art, those were one of the ways that uh, at this time they created a, a support for the chapel itself. Right? And so there's this need in order to, to do the things that they wanted to do, they had to build in the support. The other is that you, it's maybe harder to see, but there's an, uh, uh, an awning that's covering uh, the chapel, and that was put there in an effort to try to keep the creativity. They, they were finding the acid rain and things like that. The moisture was seeping in, and it was destroying some of the carvings. And so there was this effort to try to, uh, through the use of scaffolding and uh, the cover, to, to keep that creativity. So what does this mean for us? Well, when Craig introduced me, he talked about the workshop model. What my colleagues and I have found was that if we could use this approach um, that we see in literacy, uh, Lucy Calkins has uh, um, done a lot of work with this, Brian Camborn, they demonstrate this need for some consistency in our learning. Carl brought up the idea of culture. It's really about providing a structure okay, that we can build understanding in, construct understanding in, construct creativity in. And so we found that by using these four things, these four elements that we can, um, in a consistent way, that we can support the construction of understanding. We can create a culture of learning. This is my wife in front of what we like to call a pile of rocks. Um, part of the, our trip was also a self-guided tour across Scotland, walking across Scotland. Um, and along the way, we saw on our map, uh, it said, uh, Tour Castle Ruins. And we thought, what a great idea. Let's go and see about what's at these ruins. Um, we went off the path. We spent hours looking for this. And when we found it, it was a pile of rocks. But it was empowering. We had the choice to be able to go do that. We worked hard. We talked about that work is maybe a four-letter word, but we worked hard and we created um, a new path and we created new ideas and we created memories. And we still talk about and remember that pile of rocks. So we need to look for opportunities to have choice in our classrooms. We need to have opportunities for choice in our learning. We need to look for those, be aware of them, we as instructors need to trust, accept our students, can be able, our learners can be able to make good choices, and then we need to make the subtle shifts, the adjustments that we need to do. I'm, I appreciate what um, Craig and Bruce were saying, but as a math teacher, I don't think it's so hard to get students involved if we provide them with choice. But that's the key. Too often we're not providing learners with choice. And then the final piece, um, this is again back to Roslyn Chapel. This is called the uh, apprenticeship or, or the apprentice pillar. Okay? The story goes that the master uh, mason left to go on a trip and left the apprentice in charge. And when he came back, this was what he found, this beautiful pillar. Whereas if you compare it to the pillar in the back that he had done, you see a stark contrast. As the story keeps going, the, ma uh, the master mason then killed the apprentice, okay? <laughs> Let me guarantee that is not the, the model that I'm trying to purport here. But it does represent a structure, a, 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 an approach that I think can be useful. Betty brought up role models, and I think that that's one of the things that we can really consider. Pearson introduced this idea of a gradual release of responsibility, that what we need to do as a teachers, uh, as mentors, is model for our students, make our thinking visible. We then need to guide their thinking, give opportunities for them uh, to try it out and then support them in that, and then monitor their thinking, assess whether or not they're making progress to the world. I want my students to make better pillars than I would. In order to do that, I'm going to have to gradually release responsibility for them to be able to give it a go. I don't want you to leave here thinking that you're either a learner or a student. 
or that the people that populate your classrooms are learners or students. These are created. Okay? The learners are created. We need to be able to support learners. We need to be able to support students to become learners. And I think the ideas of using structure, of using uh, choice, and of using an apprenticeship model are ways that we can do that so that we can have sustainable students into the 21st century. Thank you very much. Thank you, David.